say thanks so much for coming and um, to welcome you to uh, one of our um, in, like, kind of program of institutional um, kind of activities and workshops and talks that will be happening throughout the Triennale uh, here at Mood. Um, so um, like, do consider this space, uh, which is kind of an exhibition, kind of a project space, kind of a workshop, kind of an amphitheatre. Um, do consider it as somewhere that you can come and use the Wi-Fi and kind of organise things and have meetings and um, you know have tea. Um, and I kind of feel like this is part of you know part of the city now for the next few, few weeks. Um, and um, check out the website and see what other tools and events we've got coming up. Um, so please, um, yeah, be part of the part of um, Thanks so much for coming. I'm going to introduce uh, Justin Miller. And hand over, in fact, because one of the things about the Institute effect is that we are moving from institution to institution. Um, and this is the moment in which we're transitioning from storefront, uh, from um, Round Experiment, Institute for Round Experiment, um, to Instructor. So, to mark this important occasion, we're going to hand over the key um, to Instructor Institute. So, welcome to the Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the fabulous key. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Tonight, we're going to speak about Moscow and about publishing in the 21st century. And um, we are here representing Strelka Institute in Moscow, which is a postgraduate research institute, public space, bar, restaurant, all around kind of. Um, rather special kind of place. And I'm not going to say very much about Strelka, the place, because Renan Magetrik is going to talk about it and its role in the city of Moscow in a few minutes. But I'm going to talk about the Strelka Press, the publishing program that um, you can see represented on the billboard over here and in the postcards on your seats. So please help yourself with those. Have a look through the, the material on the, on the boards there. With the, um, or on the iPads, and um, generally just kind of soak up uh, what we feel is a new kind of, of publishing discourse. So there was a moment in, in early 2010 when Strzok decided that he wanted to do a publishing program, and or even earlier than that. And um, most universities have some kind of publishing program. And they tend to publish the, you know, the research of their scholars, and, and it's all you know, quite academic. And um, it was a particular moment, I said, because it was a moment when everyone was talking about the crisis of the book. Everyone said, oh, books are dying, bookshops are closing, it's, you know, it's criticism is over, it's all the internet now, blah, blah, blah. And so we had to ask ourselves if we're going to start a publishing program. How do we do publishing in the 21st century? And the answer to that, we decided after several months of kicking around ideas, was to avoid traditional publishing altogether. Because what we had noticed is that everyone was talking about the death of the book. There was no such thing as the death of the book. In fact, if you look at books today, they're better than they were 10 years ago, much better. Because they have to, because, you know, Cheap paperbacks are history now. You, know, you can get all of that for free online. And so book production has become much more special. Book publishers are becoming much more competitive with each other on quality and on definitiveness, not on price and accessibility. So books are getting better. What we really had was a crisis of the publishing industry because the publishing didn't know how to make money anymore. And that's because they had such kind of heavy infrastructure with you know, shipping books and distribution to shops and all this kind of stuff. So we said we're going to keep, you know, we're going to avoid all of that and we're going to launch all of our books digitally, or at least what we call digital first. That means we publish everything as an ebook first, and then gradually we introduce print. And we're about to introduce a print on demand option. So if you want a book in the printed version, you just order it and it comes straight to your house. Uh, but you don't have to go to a shop and you don't have to go to Amazon. Um, now why is that interesting? Because in a way it was an opportunity for us to think not just about how to go to publishing, but to think about writing and publishing in general, to think about new formats. And I was a journalist and a critic and it was very clear to me that um, that industry had its own crisis. Um, 
uh, the word counts and articles were getting shorter and shorter. Everybody wanted less words and more pictures. Um, at the same time, there was a crisis in the book industry. So we were asking ourselves, is there something in the middle that would be interesting? And one of the inspirations to me was uh, a newspaper in London called the London Review of Books, where they published lengthy reviews and essays, 10,000 words long sometimes, and it's just text, no pictures. It's just an old-fashioned newspaper. And um, every, news every newspaper and magazine I could think of at the time was decreasing in circulation. They were selling less copies all the time. But the London Review of Books, with these long essays and no pictures, the circulation was going up. So there was clearly an appetite for something like that. And we decided that what we were going to launch was a publishing house for essays. Essays about contemporary issues in architecture and design and the city. Um, basically, we were trying to revive what we call the long form, as opposed to short magazine articles or books, but the long form. And I, I found myself asking, you know, if Walter Benjamin wanted to publish his essays on Berlin or on Moscow today, where would he do that? And there are very few places, you know, there are no magazines that are going to publish 30,000 words. Um, they know they're kind of too short for books. So we kind of found this in-between space, a kind of third space for publishing. And that's what we're exploring with our series. Uh, we've launched nine books in English so far, which you can find on the shelves and on your seat here. There are also a few postcards in this envelope you've got, which are forthcoming. And a couple of those are not quite available yet. Um, you can find them all on the website. You can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them on iTunes. You can read them on phones, tablets, iPads, computers, whatever you want. They're very good on planes. Um, and tonight, in fact, one of our speakers, Kuba uh, Snowflake, his book has just been published today about um, the microrail and the kind of Soviet housing uh, complexes that cover the whole of the country. And he's asking the question, how do you preserve something like that, something generic? Um, and pretty much that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to let the speakers take over and talk a little bit about Moscow. Um, what I've done is set the scene, like how Straka, you know, a, a Moscow-based institute is becoming a crossroads for ideas in a kind of global discourse about the city. Uh, Russia has, has a long tradition of importing ideas. This is, an, this is a slightly opposite situation where Moscow is providing a platform for ideas inside the country to uh, disseminate globally and for ideas all around the world to pass through Moscow. And somehow, this, is, this shows what the Institute effect, somehow this idea of spreading a discourse is part of the Strelka effect. And that's something that I'm going to let Brendan Bergetra speak about now. Brendan is a, is a lecturer and, and you know, researcher and curator who's uh, very much involved in Strelka. And I'm going to let him tell you more. So Brendan. Justin. Um, okay, thank you everyone for coming. Um, the title of this event, or the title of this talk, is The Stroke Effect. Um, the title of this sort of larger event is The Institute Effect. Um, it's an interesting phrase and an interesting concept. Um, I've been thinking about it for the last few days as I anticipated speaking here. And I think what's particularly interesting about it is that for an institute of any kind, and particularly for an institute like Stroka, which has, um, as Justin mentioned, has an educational component, a publishing component, it also has a sort of professional arm. Uh, it's basically doing several different things. Uh, for an institute like that, it's difficult to actually gauge what its effects are. Um, and I think that, you know, for, for any institute, even an institute with very specific and clearly identifiable production, uh, like say an academic institute which is producing papers or a professional one which is giving consultants uh, consultations to you know, company. There aren't really actually clearly quantifiable and uh, understandable ways that we need to assess how an institute is affecting the world at large or its industry or its city or anything else. So actually what I'd like to try to do in this very short talk is try to 
express what I perceive Stroko's effects to be. And um, basically raise the question of, you know, how can we do this better? Um, I'm in no way presenting this as something definitive, but what I'm trying to do is use Stroke as a case study to show the difficulty in actually um, understanding and appreciating and ultimately improving the effects of an institution. Um, there's a number of ways that Stroke actually itself has tried to understand its effects. This is a very complicated diagram that I don't expect anyone to try to understand. What it's trying to do is um, collect uh, a number of projects which have occurred either directly connected to Strauka Institute or on the periphery of Strauka, and sort of begin to almost in, at, as one would connect stars in a constellation, try to connect projects and um, moments in time and show how one led to another and one influenced another. So this is one way maybe of trying to judge Strauka's effect, which is purely through kind of professional output and educational output. Um, another one, which actually one of Stroke's students did last year for, in one of the studios, was to try to assess Stroke's effects purely as a kind of human network of individuals and organizations, and how the institute itself acts as a node or as a sort of enormous constellation of nodes, um, which connects, you know, not only Moscow to the rest of the world, or an individual within the institute to other individuals, but also institutes like the ones featured here together. Uh, but of course, this, this is a kind of alternative one where the same researcher, he tried to do the same thing based on connecting uh, people affiliated with the institute by the place of origin, and on the right by uh, the, a series of uh, disciplines that they could be working in, politics, economics, architecture, etc. So, you know, I, I only show these in a way to illustrate the problem. Um, of course, these kinds of things are impressive visually, but they're opaque. Uh, for me, they reveal almost nothing really about <coughs> what stroke it is and how it actually affects the outside world, except for the fact that it's very densely networked. Um, so basically, what I would, what I'd like to do here, what I'm trying to do is um, focus on something which is not immaterial and abstract, like a personal connection or like a professional influence. But actually start with something based in the world of material um, and, and physicality and see if we can, through looking at the basic unchanging physical elements of, of Stroka, understand what its non-physical, social, and um, sort of creative influences are. So this is just a sort of aerial shot of, of the Institute here. It's um, basically in the center of Moscow, which is a, a very layered uh, city historically and architecturally, and one interesting thing about Moscow um, is that its changes in ideology and politics and um, ambition are really written in the architecture of the city. So um, you can really sense uh, an era and also a ruler specifically by the architecture that he produced. Um, and that's produced a very interesting kind of urban fabric, but it's also produced a very incoherent in, in many ways and dysfunctional city. Um, and one of the founding sort of beliefs or ambitions of Strelka was to try to figure out a way to, in a concentrated, limited space, produce ideas and uh, raise issues which could then hopefully help um, solve some of the problems of Moscow, or at least contribute new energy to discussions which needed to happen and which could be beneficial for the city at large. And so that's a sort of very ambiguous, you know, and hard to quantify, but also very important and foundational effect that Stroka is trying to have. Um, okay, so sort of to zoom in a bit, this is what the, what the Institute looks like itself. Again, for me, what I'm trying to do is to hopefully actually just give a sense of, of the physical space of Stroka. Um, the thing I would say about this image, what it communicates maybe more than anything else, is that it's a it's a porous institution. It's, it's open to the public uh, as much as it can be. Um, and this I'll talk in, in more detail later. But what I would say is that much of the things, many of the things that Justin mentioned earlier about Stroker Press are an extension of that sort of openness and that desire to kind of transmit and uh, create conversations and dialogues and, and challenge people's thinking. Um, based in this sort of relatively small 
location in a very specific place, but, but transmitting out and hopefully sort of having an effect and an influence you know, across the world. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is actually just through explaining some of the vital elements of the campus of Stroka, explain how it um, affects its neighborhood, it affects uh, the, the issues that it's interested in, the disciplines that its researchers and its staff um, are experts in, um, and ultimately how it, to try to, how it sort of affects everyone who sort of comes in contact with it. Okay, so the, this first element which is highlighted here is education and studios. Um, one, one very important, uh, maybe defined feature of Stroka is that every year it hosts about 40 researchers um, from around the world, different disciplines, and um, engages them in about nine months of intensive research on various topics, but all of which are kind of related to urban issues and related to Russia. Um, and so these studios take a variety of forms, um, physically and also kind of socially. Um, but one of the important components is that Stroka has um, experts from the outside world and from various disciplines and, and various um, kind of dispositions come to the institute and give talks and really kind of directly engage with the researchers and, and kind of apply some pressure to their thinking and to their um, assumptions. So this is a talk not long ago. Um, to Jean-Louis Cohen. And one thing that I want to say about it is this is a kind of fairly standard image of, this is about all of the 40 researchers from last year, kind of accepting information from an expert. Um, but immediately afterwards, there's a um, sort of direct dialogue between two or three of the students and the speaker, where they can um, pursue lines of inquiry and, and, and sort of tap into speaker's knowledge in a sort of more direct way and um, in a way increase, not to belabor the point, but to sort of increase the effect of, of his presentation and his knowledge by applying it to the research that they're doing at that time um, and sort of applying the lens that they're currently using to kind of understand the world and understand their work um, and sort of asking and expecting someone with more experience and sort of maybe a deeper knowledge of certain things to kind of help them along in the specific area. Um, okay, basically, you know, the nature of these spaces, these studio spaces, so particularly this one, is kind of valuable and, and is basically valuable in order to allow for a huge diversity in kind of, you know, of um, types of events and types of educational or um, communicative experiences. Uh, this is one which is like a, a very large video lab, a video game uh, workshop, which was not which was open to the public and was part of a, a public program that I'll describe in more detail later. Um, but there are also much smaller workshops which are very tiny in, in, in size and maybe contain only three people or four people. And they're about um, you know, trying to express architectural <coughs> ideas or design ideas in a new way or in a way which, is un which we are unaccustomed to. Um, so this was about storytelling and sort of almost using literature as a means of communicating architectural or urban ideas or aspirations. Um, but the other vital component of, these, of this aspect of the campus and this aspect of Stroka is the, um, the studios themselves. Um, what happens basically is the 40 or so students who join each year, they're ultimately divided into four or five studios, um, each of which is dedicated to a specific theme. Uh, in the past, there's been a number of themes led by a, num a number of sort of uh, studio directors. Uh, this is a complete list. Um, some of them are very kind of vague in, in, in their concept, for instance, thinning. Um, other ones are very hyper specific, such as retail or offices. Um, and part of what's interesting about this and part of what's challenging about it is that basically um, each researcher regardless of his or her background and regardless of his or her um, personal interests sometimes, is expected to respond to this theme as is defined by their theme director. Um, and this is a particularly sort of interesting and potentially fertile but also very challenging um, situation because the makeup of Stroka is um, diverse. So this is a, a, a shot from the studio that I um, was part of last year, which was about education 
the subject of education and design. Um, and as you can see here, you know, it's made up of urban researcher from the US, architect from Belarus, digital media guy from Denmark, architect from Russia, journalist from Russia, journalist from Belarus, international relations specialist from Russia. So this for me is, as I experienced it, an incredibly important part of the stroke effect, if, if you want to call it that, which is that basically you take these people who are from different who are different ages, from different parts of the world, different educational backgrounds, and also different interests, and you have to somehow, within the context of a studio, get them to speak a common language and get them to sort of be able to produce something together and also produce something individually, which will sort of uh, resonate with and build upon the work of the other people in the studio. So this, for me, is a, is a problem that we face in international collaborative context everywhere. Um, and it's actually, I think, an area where Skoka is really trying to push things forward. Um, it's really challenging, um, particularly because you know the mechanism through which people have been taught to communicate in an academic context or, or, or professional context can be very different. Um, and the way that Skoka resolves or attempts to resolve it is by instituting a sort of um, presentation-based approach to uh, the subject of research and also the idea of you know, creative generative research, so research which is producing ideas and proposals. Um, it's very much based on a sort of architectural uh, educational model where you're being expected to <coughs> present your ideas verbally but also fit, uh, visually, diagrammatically. Um, and this is enormously challenging for the students themselves. Um, I know that the students that were in my studio, particularly ones who were coming from a background of writing or a background of uh, filmmaking, etc., find it very difficult. But this, for me, is one of the really critical effects of Scope. Is that at least for the people who are who are in there for the time that they are, they're forced to sort of develop a new set of skills and, and for some of them, an entirely new uh, way of communicating, which is based on sort of the challenges of interdisciplinarity and kind of internationalism. And I'll also say um, one thing about it is that basically, like I say, it's a kind of architectural model. So it has a jury system uh, with sometimes very sort of brutal feedback. Um, also, which some people, depending on their educational background, did not have to deal with previously. Um, and I'll say what this experience was like for me personally, in terms of the strong effect on me, was very uncomfortable because um, not only for the students, but also for the people who are leading the studios, um, the, the sort of system of reviews which Shogi has built in, into it really um, very can very succinctly identify everything that's wrong with what you're doing. Um, and also, I mean, from an educational point of view, or, or as a tutor or whatever, we might be doing. So this is a sort of moment where particularly sort of sharp tongued and sharp witted. Um, director of one of the studios was sort of reviewing uh, our studio work and I'm sort of, win sort of wincing and feeling extremely frustrated and upset because of the fact that what we're trying to do and think ideas that I know were resolved in the minds of the presenter were not being communicated correctly. Um, and so for me personally, the effect has been one of uh, <laughs> intense self-criticality and to some extent, okay. Okay, the other thing that I want to say, this is a, a so that's basically the, the one very large large component. The second very large component is is um, taking place in this large courtyard and uh, these steps you see on the, on the right, and then this sort of box which contains uh, a cafe and a kind of media wall in the library. Um, and what this is really expressing is the sort of intense engagement. Uh, with the public that Stroka is currently involved in, particularly in the summer when the weather is uh, appropriate. Um, this is an event uh, that was obviously very well attended, lecture by Toy Rito. Um, and in terms of the Stroka effect, for me, this is actually one of the most blatant and easily identifiable, recognizable aspects, is that there is a very rigorous creative and surprising public program which takes place every summer and is very, very well attended and which is really about welcoming in the neighborhood, welcoming in the city of Moscow and, and sort of 
providing for them food for thought and food for potentially action. Um, and you know, on Sriyoka's website, um, and this again is also an extension of the openness, all of these talks are available on Sriyoka's website and you can look at them. Um, there's just an incredible like, sort of diversity. I'll just quickly identify a couple of things. Like for one thing, uh, on the top there, uh, St. Martin's, they, they hosted uh, students from St. Martin's, so they're acting as almost like a kind of embassy for other schools to come in and sort of work at them. And I'm speaking from having witnessed it for the first time this year, a really impressive diversity of topics which range from global and enormous in scope to tiny and local, um, but also vital, extremely important. Um, yeah, so just in terms of the scale of what they're doing, it's really, for me, super impressive. So since 2010, 72 workshops, 199 lectures, blah, 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 blah. Um, so yeah, so basically, um, very rigorous, very active, uh, popular engagement with the public, which is, for me, one of the vital kind of elements of the Stroke effect. Uh, of course, again, you know, in terms of what I was saying before, what that effect is, is impossible to actually assess. What do people think when they leave? What, what happens after? What conversations are started? And what will be the long-term ramifications of those, of those conversations? We, we can never know. Um, but I will say, purely in terms of attendance, it's extremely strong, a sort of profound effect. One that actually, I thought of this image today because of the terrible weather. The bad weather having, I just I can't really express how touching an image like this is for me, because really the weather in Moscow can be terrible. And having outdoor events seems almost suicidal as a public program, but actually, regardless of how cold it is or it's the fact that it's raining, there are people there. there that, there's that sort of hunger for ideas and for interesting material and for free things um, that you're getting a very consistent, sort of interesting, surprising um, audience. OK. Um, I'll say almost nothing about this except to say a, a further extension of the sort of public open dimension of Strelka is that it has a bar and a sort of terrace restaurant, which, um, which for, in, terms, in the context of this Strelka effect idea, uh, is very interesting to me because it's actually like a kind of, um, it provides a sort of energy, but it's almost like a sort of, um, a kind of magnet that draws people in people who wouldn't necessarily be in this part of town or wouldn't necessarily be, be interested in, in an institute like this. It sort of brings them in, and, and when you're in the restaurant at a certain time, you get such a strange kind of cross-section of people um, talking and you know negotiating things. Um, and for me, this is just another dimension of that kind of openness and desire for Stroka to be a kind of a hub and a sort of haven for a certain mentality, which um, in, to a certain extent in, in, in Russian politics and Moscow politics is not always um, embraced. Uh, okay, the final point that I'll say is that the final element worth noting is that there's a consultancy which basically is a professional arm of Stroka um, and which works um, on paid work for professional clients and also for political clients of the government essentially. Um, and so, one thing that's worth saying is that, you know, Stroker produces, and if you look at their like Facebook page or their Flickr page or anything, they produce an absolutely incredible amount of very stylish images of themselves. But actually, you know, we know, or most people know that real decisions and real sort of work and money gets exchanged in environments like this, um, and in formats like this. So I think it's one thing that's really interesting about the stroke effect is that although stroke in a way has very idealistic aims and also very cool that actually uh, Vidaya was not only a place where he lived, it's not only a place that is important uh, for the conceptual art, it's not only the place where the bulldozer are exhibition took place, but it's also, let's say, an atmosphere or a landscape that was influencing this art, that was let's say, uh, inspiration for the artists. And I started looking into other conceptual artists that used to live there or not really far away from there. So for example, the group Collective Actions, which is 
probably the most well-known conceptual uh, artist group from these times. They were using in their performances, because mostly they were doing performances, they were using emptiness. The emptiness was always an imminent feature of everything they did. Like, the emptiness is a feature of microarray, it's full of empty space between the buildings, as I showed you in the photography, and also appears here. It's kind of superficial, but if you take a look at uh, photos of this time, on the right side, like on these slides I will show you right now, on the right side you will see the piece of art, and on the left side you will see the reference to architecture. So in here you can see a poem. It's called Elementary Poetry by Andrei Monastirsky from this collective action group. And on the left side there is a diagram of how the neighborhood should work. And actually the logic that is behind these is very similar. You can see that the logic of the architect was the logic of the best, most optimal, most effective connection between the, uh, between the elements of the urban scheme. And the same happens with words in the poem of Andrei Monastirsky question of let's say, geometrical connection between the words that make up the poem. If you take a look at the other things that, uh, that the architects and artists were doing, on the right hand, on the right side you can see a um, poema, a poetry gram by Dimitri Prito. A poetry gram is something between a graphic and, uh, and a poem. These are actually words, but they are being put in such a way that they create some sort of uh, some sort of graphic or shape. It's something uh, a typology that didn't exist before. If you think about this, the artists were using ready-made objects. Every word is a ready-made object. Every word exists by itself. And the same thing happened to the architects. They had a building that was a ready-made object that was pre-designed for them. And the only thing that they had to do is creating compositions out. So you can see that both the architects and the artists are actually doing things, they are, doing, they, are, they, are, they are acting in a way that is very similar by its logic. Also, repetition. Uh, repetition is uh, another dominant feature of both modernist architecture and art. Moreover, uh, the artists of these times, whenever they looked, at the landscape created by the architects, they were also comparing to this. On the left side, you can see uh, standard sizes for typical projects by the architect of Lazar Cherikov. He actually made a set of sizes that should be used by all of the architects. So every building should allow people to do the things that are here. This is a statistical person that should fit to all the situations in a statistical building. Uh, instead of statistical person, uh, the artist Victor Pirovara Pir 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 was referring to a lonely person or lonely man. And he made a whole series of paintings about the lonely man. So there is a design of the biography of the lonely man, where all the biography of a typical man in the microbiology is being designed from uh, the moment of his war to his death. Then there is a, let's say, a scheme of the day or a regime of the day of the lonely man. So every person that lives in the microbiology can actually do the things that are there on this on this uh, on this block every day, and then there is a design of a typical dwelling of a lonely man, which is which is the dwelling of the um, of the micro rayon. The interesting thing is are the small are the small drawings that are on the uh, bottom right side, which is a typical dream of a lonely man, typical view from the window of a, of a lonely man. And to come back to preservation. If we think of this, is it any different from the gardens of Giverny, uh, which were a source of inspiration for uh, the Impressionists 100 years earlier? 100 years earlier, Monet was going to these gardens that you can see here, and there he, was, he was painting the Impressionist paintings, that are, let's say, very similar. Uh, and because of that, um, the gardens of Giverny are being considered the heritage and something very important for the whole humanity. Is it possible to look with the same lens onto Gelayaka and they can look at more conceptual works that are not that um, that are not let's say visually um, similar but they have the same logic and compare it with uh, the modernist architecture. Can we see the same conceptual logic 
logic which is standing behind the conceptual art and conceptual models of architecture. I like very much this piece of art here on the right side. Uh, these words, they say in place of the don't lean on the window, and they can be seen on all the wagons of the metro. But if you look from the right angle, they actually do look like houses, like white prefabricated houses, somewhere in the landscape, as it looks in reality. So the question is, uh, the question is, is it possible to preserve it, and does it really deserve to be preserved? I was actually trying to convince you that there is some kind of an intangible heritage behind this architecture, and that there is any sense of uh, preserving these buildings. UNESCO is an organization that is, let's say, the, the avant-garde of uh, preservation, which is the most important and biggest organization that deals with that, and it has two programs. The first one is called uh, the world heritage, which are physical buildings, and the second one are intangible heritages like rituals, culture, and UNESCO is trying to be very popular. What happens is that there is not a program, not a single program that addresses the mixture of these two. I'm worried that an argument in here, uh, there is a potential to preserve architecture because of the intangible uh, components that is embedded in this. But UNESCO doesn't have any instrument, and the same thing is with uh, all the other preservation institutions. What I'm trying to uh, argue in the book uh, is that UNESCO has to change. That there, there simply has to be a shift uh, in preservation methods, and uniqueness has to be divided in a different way than it's being defined right now. I'm not going to speak about how it can be done, but uh, there is a lot of speculation uh, about this in the book, which uh, was published today, and uh, I encourage everybody who is interested to read it. Thank you. Without change during these 20 years in Moscow, is 
actually the mayor of the city, Yuri Lushkov, and that's why the project called uh, Lushkov Era, because of his name and because of his presence. He was absolutely new type of figure for, for, the, for the city as a politician, and of course, when um, he was dismissed, it was clear that this era is over. So for me, it was very, uh, I would say, kind of technical framework for, um, for this period of time to try to look what exactly was built exactly at this period of time. And actually, to prove that this architecture is, has no value is very easy. It's really built of the bad materials. Uh, it, is, it, didn't, it didn't invent something new. But if you look at these two um, slides, actually, one is, of course, the building built in Gama uh, as an example of modernism. And another is a, actually a certain a suit, a disguise that was applied on the building, was accept, uh, perceived as a state. An attempt to develop a historical architectural style was, of course, attempt to uh, close this gap. But uh, it's uh, bad to be presented in, in another group. I will uh, talk about this a bit later. And the final stylistic group in the Unicards is actually metabolic. It is an attempt to sort of create a sort of um, hybrid out of old construction in view and through this to give a second life of old buildings and uh, old structures that could be um, The second group which I extracted in this collection of my business, I call vernaculars, and it's about, um, uh, it's about the way how uh, individualism applies on the different scales and changes the appearance of the whole city. And it's of course connected with the vision of the mayor who, was, uh, uh, who because of the power which he had, uh, was allowed to really implement this kind of vision. And uh, uh, how, why, why it actually happened? Because as Kuba said, this kind of state-owned uh, design companies uh, really were subjected to his will. And that's why uh, he was able to really implement his own vision into the city space. That's how uh, he saw that Moscow should look like, and usually uh, critics call it Lushkov style. Of course, a uh, very important uh, feature of uh, uh, vernaculars is actually that these groupings are never trying to be unique. They try to merge into the city, into the fabric of the city, and uh, they also try to be functional. Uh, never, none of this building was built just so. It also was, it always was a reason. And on the right, uh, this is actually a square next to Kremlin, um, which was uh, in the, this kind of public space, actually is uh, covering a huge shopping mall. So when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, of course, it was necessary to build new great centers to uh, kind of feed the, the, the new functions of the city. And that's what the reason to build this public space. So each, each uh, building built out of the group vernacular, of course, uh, is about uh, the way we need to prove that uh, this, this structure should be built. But what is the most important uh, and why this I call their network is actually is about the network of relationships that uh, was established between the people who somehow involved in the process of construction. So it is architects, it is uh, of course uh, government and uh, uh, constructors. This kind of network is absolutely important let me say force which creates an appearance of uh, the city, and uh, I would say that this is um, this is a, uh, this is something which will stay probably for a very long time in a, in, a, in the whole uh, uh, let me say development of architecture, and this is what I would call uh, uh, local local and uh, vernacular uh, feature of uh, of the Soviet of, sorry of Russian architecture. The third group I call phonics, and it's about uh, resurrection. Actually, uh, oh, this uh, one image suddenly disappeared. On the left, it was the meeting of Mikhail Gorbachev with Russian Orthodox Church, and it was the first time when, after 70 years, uh, authorities met with the representative of, uh, of, of, of uh, Orthodox Church. In architecture, it realized uh, literally. Uh, idea of uh, religious repentance 
started to be uh, uh, presented in the resurrection. So the building on the right uh, is actually the resurrected church, and it was uh, resurrected according to the measurement, uh, really uh, uh, following the original design. But since the development of the of, of this uh, phenomenon, uh, contemporary features of flight, and one of the most important one, I, I named it as commercial, uh, commercial functionality, is actually an ability of space to give profit, uh, transform this uh, from, the, from, from the beginning very new idea into something special. Um, many architects was really in, involved in this process, and one of them who actually uh, really supported this idea of retro development 